How appropriate during this season that we, in our Judeo-Christian faith, acknowledge Messiah as king and give him every stone of our life that has been defiled. And he dedicates it and he washes it. There's nothing but the blood of Christ. Hanukkah is coming up. Uh, you know, uh, Josephus termed it the Festival of Lights. How many people know about Hanukkah? Exactly, huh? We know about it. We've, uh, we've, watched it. we've watched different things on it. You've heard that it's maybe eight days or something like that. And the time we have this morning, because let me just be honest with you. I think we've had church today. Can I just give you all a little bit of history? A little bit of context of things? And we'll, we'll bring it back around to Jesus, because we actually do see Jesus celebrating Hanukkah. And we'll be looking at that in, in John chapter 10. But this morning, you know, I want to tell you just a little bit about Hanukkah, the origin of Hanukkah. And before I do that, I, I don't want to I don't want to disenfranchise or burst anyone's bubble, but we're in a wonderful season, and I'll bring this full circle, so please come with me. But you may or may not know this, but it's Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. That rock anybody? Well, hold on, let me get you around to it, okay? Because I believe there's substantial grace and merit to celebrate his birth in his time. We can look because of John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and we know his temple schedule. We know whenever he was on the temple, whenever he heard from the angel that he was going to conceive and bear a son who, you know, would go and prepare a way. We know that time, and without getting into it, you know, uh, we know the different time frames that add up. We know that John the Baptist was born on Passover, right around that time frame, just by being able to backdate it. It's very interesting, if you've ever celebrated Passover before, one of the things they do is oh, we leave a seat open for Elijah because of Malachi and, and the other prophets. They realized that Elijah would come and teach them all things concerning the Messiah. That's why they're really excited at Passover. They even open up the door in the middle to see if Elijah's at the door. They come in. Guess who was born on Passover. John the Baptist. And they're really excited. Why? Because right after that follows Messiah in this tradition. Well, we see six months from them because we can read the Bible and says six months later that Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit, Christ. We can see that he was born probably right around the Feast of Tabernacles. What is Tabernacles? Is when God dwells among us. And then you understand John when he says, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Isn't that kind of cool? But that's in the September time frame. But when was Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit? Well, if you take all those numbers and you do all that fun things, guess where it puts you? Around Kislev 25. Hanukkah. So now we can understand something because the rabbinic traditions are this. When do they celebrate birthdays? In the rabbinical tradition back then, what they did is when you were conceived, when you came into existence. So now we can see that we can celebrate Christ's birthday during this season. Isn't that neat? So don't let anybody uh, try to dissuade you. Don't go, and, uh, go, don't go run and take back all the presents you were going to bring me. Um, <laughs> we can celebrate Christ during this season. Isn't that neat? So now you can have a frame of reference and say, no, we're, we're really in a good time. But Hanukkah. I just want to talk a little bit about the origin of Hanukkah. You know, where do we see Hanukkah? Well, we'll see Jesus actually celebrating it in Jerusalem. He's coming in in John 10. But where we, where we don't see it is anywhere else. Why? Because it's not in our Bible, but it's in a historical book. In fact, there's a collection of books called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are written from anywhere from uh, 200 B.C. all the way to about 100 A.D. They're historical accounts and different things like that. It's not that um, they're bad books or, or anything else. It's what we consider uninspired Scripture. Both the Jews and the Christians did not see it as inspired, meaning written by the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through men, but it was a good uh, um, historical account. And that's where you hear, if you've ever heard before, the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees details what 
happened to the Jews in this Hellenistic intertestamental period. We see that after their after the return from exile in about 586 BC, they were uh, they built their temple, Nehemiah's temple, but they were constantly under rule. They were always governed by someone. Well, Alexander the Great came through, and he he was conquering the known world at the time. He gets to Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple, and they and the records show that he met with the high priest. And if you know anything about Greek culture at the time in this uh, Grecian Empire, how did they conquer something? They came in and they set up their gods, they set up their rules, and they made everyone follow them. You know, in, in Roman Empire, what it became is like a melting pot. It's a lot like what America is today. A melting pot where everyone kind of came in and everything, pantheistic panthe- society, and they kind of just pulled all the gods and said, yay! But Greeks were not that way. They were very arbitrary. They came in. So when Alexander the Great came in, he came in with full intention to bring Judah under submission and under control to Grecian rule. But having met with the high priest, he was so impressed with the beauty and the splendor of the temple. And he was so inspired by the sincerity of the worship to Yahweh that he didn't... He, he, Jerusalem was, a, uh, was an annexed city in the Greek empire. They didn't have statues to the Greek gods. They allowed them, even though they were under Greek control, he allowed them religious, religious freedom. So they freely got to worship Yahweh. They got to continue in their sacrifices. They got to continue with the high priest. They got to continue all these different things. And in fact, this is really cool, he so was impressed by them that he mandated a tax uh, law that every sabbatical year, every seven years, the Jews didn't have to pay taxes. Now, that's a pretty good thing. I wish we had that today. Every seven years, not have to pay taxes, right? Amen. Well, unfortunately, Alexander died. <laughs> that didn't last too long for the Jews. They began to come under uh, Grecian control until the Seleucid Empire kind of came out and Syria was running around. And up pops a guy named Antiochus, uh, Epiphanes. That Epiphanes is a title, not a last name. It meant like a manifest God. He was crazy. Um, <laughs> He was seriously nuts. He came and he conquered Jerusalem. But he had a very, very totalitarian Greek mind out of the Seleucid Empire feel where, in fact, he wanted to replace everything. He abolished Judaism. He ransacked everything, the temple. He, he defiled the Torah. In fact, he had an image of Zeus made. And by the way, on the, in the account... The face of Zeus had the likeness of Antiochus, but no one wanted to say anything because he really wanted to be a god. And they even had a little quip about him. They would say, because Epiphanes means God manifests, they'd say Epimenes, which means lunatic. (laughs) They'd call him Antiochus Epimenes. But he he had the Greek god Zeus put up into the temple when it was in his likeness. And then what he began to do was sacrifice swine on the altar. Swine being an unclean animal. He would have it. In fact, he ordered that all Jews must sacrifice that way. He forbid circumcision. He forbid the reading of the Torah and the studying of it. He was just a really heinous guy. It got to the place in the contention so bad between um, the Jews because they refused. Yahweh had told them as he has told us, there will be no other gods before you. And so they held vehemently to their calls and their patriotic uh, and their and their theistic faith. In fact, one of the um, uh, the high priests at the time, his brother Yohanan, he he wanted to Hellenize. In fact, he changed his no, not Yohanan, but he changed his name to Jason. And then what he did is he said, "Hey, Antiochus, let me give you a bribe because my brother is righteous and holy. He's he's going to fight you tooth and nail. He's the high priest. Let me give you a bribe. We'll assassinate him. You let me be high priest. And what I'll do is I'll build a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Now you say, what's wrong with the gymnasium? Listen, the gymnasium at the time they were practicing nude workouts and all manner of ungodliness and things. It was just a real affront and offense to God and to His people. So." Antiochus, being the guy he is and loving money, he said, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Another guy comes into the picture and says, hey, I'd like to out-bribe Jason. So he says, hey, you can do that too. For a second, he tried to. He, went, he was going to pay with the temple money. He ran out. He didn't have enough. So he began to give them the ornaments of worship and the menorah and things like that of gold to make the bribe. And then Jason ran him back out because he wanted to be in control. 
some crazy things going on in this intertestamental between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is all in the book of Maccabees. Well, it gets to the place where he starts, literally, Antiochus begins to torture and kill the Jews for their faith. He's trying everything he can do to get them eat, to eat uh, meat sacrificed to idols and to recount their faith and things like that. And we see a lot of the martyrs. In fact, uh, many scholars believe that Hebrews 11, talking about the ones they're not worthy of, is actually pointing back to Maccabees as well. That, that this world wasn't um, worthy of because of their sacrifice. Because many of them died, had their hands cut off and their tongues ripped out and you named it and their, and their babies hung around them and women thrown off the wall. All in effort to just squish. They wanted to crush the Jewish faith. We see that Antiochus as a full picture of, uh, of the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. Daniel actually was prophesying about Antiochus in 11 and Jesus comes again in Matthew 24 and says, Hey, everybody know what happened there? It's going to happen again. He gets to the place of a small village uh, where a local priest, uh, Matthias, is asked to do the same thing. He wants to sac- they, they want to sacrifice a, a swine on the altar. He refuses. Another apostate priest comes in to do it. Matthias, filled with righteous indignation, runs him through with a spear. Now you think that's the end of Matthias. No, he had five sons. And you don't get five Jewish boys upset. I mean, the Spirit of God. Have you ever seen the battles that they've, that they've overcome, 1961 or 67 to 73? Man, these guys, the, when God's with you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Well, they overcame the soldiers, flee up to the hills, to, and it really, really began to anger Antiochus, where he began to persecute and pursue them. Well, Matthias, Matthias died, and his son, Judah Maccabee, a.k.a. what it means, the hammer, <laughs> it really does. Took a band of about a thousand, uh, um, about a thousand against a forty thousand Greek army who had been trained, skilled, and had the state of art warfare. And these boys were sticks and rocks and everything else. And guess who won? The Maccabees. That's where we heard the Maccabean revolt. We get the Book of Maccabees from. Well, they come in and they want to cleanse the temple. In fact, they didn't know what to do because the, the uh, swine being sacrificed, and they didn't know what to do. So they dismantled the altar, a stone altar, and they rebuilt it with, uh, to, uh, to spec. But they had all these stones, and they didn't know what to do with them because they'd been consecrated to the Lord. And you can read in the book of Maccabees and 1st Maccabees, somewhere around 4 or something like that. They actually sit the stones to the side in the temple, and they said, one day when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us what to do with it. Or a great prophet, they were referring to Messiah, will come and tell us what to do with these stones because we don't know what to do with them. Well, they search high and low through the temple... And unfortunately, as they're rebuilding it, one of the most important things is that the menorah needs to be lit. It's an eternal flame. It's to signify that God's lamp will never be put out. And there's many different uh, symbolism that we can draw from today. We see in the book of Revelation, the seven lamp stands. What's Jesus doing? He's the high priest going in there, and he's looking at each of these seven churches, the seven lamp stands, and he's saying, hey, listen, uh, you better trim your wicks and put in some oil. If you're not, I'm going to come and pluck you out and replace you. We see him as the high priest in Revelation. This is a very important thing, and it's very important to wor- aspect of worshiping God. Well, they can't find any sacred shimon, any oil that's been dedicated to the Lord, except they find one jar. Now, it takes about seven days to consecrate new oil. So they pour the jar in that first day, and it has to last seven days, but they only know it's going to last one day. Well, guess what the miracle is? It lasted the entire eight days. This is where the Jews begin to celebrate Hanukkah. It's because of the miracle that happened that they were able to take back the temple and kick out the Grecian army, the Seleucid Empire. They had to push them back. And as well, the miracle of the menorah staying lit. The eternal flame. Isn't that neat? And that's where Hanukkah was celebrated. That's where it came from. So for the next 150 plus years, Hanukkah was celebrated on Kisla 25. You know, the Jewish sages also say what happened in, Jew- uh, in Kisla 25, just for FYI, I'd like information. In year 47, that's where, uh, that's where um, Cain killed Abel. Same kind of thing. Kisla 25. 
It was whenever they, the abomination that caused the desolation when Antiochus set up the Zeus thing and it was Kislev 25. Three years later, they retook it and they dedicated it on Kislev 25. So we see Hanukkah on Kislev 25 this time of year. And it spans in our, in our Gregorian calendar in between November to the 1st of January, depending on the flex and flow of the Jewish calendar, the 12 to 13 month thing. But at this time, Jesus had just got through talking to the people about being a shepherd. Now, anyone uh, at that time would have understood because of the Torah, because of Micah, because of Ezekiel 34, that Jesus, when he says, I am the good shepherd, that he is saying that he is the Messiah, that he is the one that's, that, that's coming. He's the one who has come. And he really got them riled up with that. In fact, if you want to listen to it, I am means God. Good, there's none good but God. Shepherd, Psalms 23, Yahweh is your shepherd. God, God, God. That's what Jesus was saying to them. He was always just alluding. He was always trying his best to make them understand, and which they did. Today we read it and we're not reading it, but to them, that's why he was, these Jews were always so riled up and ready to get him because he was constantly trying to tell them that, the, listen, the word become flesh and is dwelling among you and you're beholding the glory of God. I'm here. Messiah, the suffering servant, is here. So they're pretty riled up. But then it says in John 10, after that, and I think it's going to be about verse 22. We'll pick up in just a little short because we're almost done today. Isn't that exciting? It said at the time, in verse 22, at the time of the Feast of Dedication. Hold on, wait a second. I thought you said Hanukkah. Okay, yeah, I did. This is a Greek version. What is dedication? What did the Jews call Hanukkah? Well, it's the lights. No, that came from Josephus. It means dedication. It's the feast of dedication. Why do they call it dedication? Because they had to rededicate the temple. So at the time of the feast, to, uh, dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. John's already letting us know even time frame. Why? Because he's, he's talking to people who are like us and he's not going to know when the feast of dedication is and why it was. And in fact... It wasn't a religious feast. This was like our 4th of July, basically. And you didn't have to leave and come to Jerusalem, but Jesus was wanting to make a point. He wanted to be in the temple on Kislev 25 because he wanted to show the nation and the nations something important. And Jesus was walking the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are Mashiach... Greek, Latin, Christ, tell us plainly. Now, this was a very controversial term at the time. In fact, the Roman garrison was uh, not too, it was pretty close by. And they had already known what the Jews had done with the Greek Empire, the Seleucid Empire, everything else. And the Roman was occupying, so they were, pre they were pretty in-depth. In fact, there was a, a, song, a psalm of Solomon going around at the time one of the rabbis created saying, we're going to kick out all of the Romans and, and, and Messiah is coming to restore the temple and all these different things. So the Romans were on guard during this time. So we have to understand Jesus' response. Because he affirms it, but he indirectly does it in a very religious manner that the Jews would get, but the Romans would just kind of go, mm, okay, we don't need to arrest him. <laughs> Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. There's another translation that says works or miracles or signs. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. He's pointing back to once again being the good shepherd, which in Psalms 23, we know who the good shepherd is. And they follow me. I give them eternal life, that eternal flame. It's interesting. And we'll skip on down. In verse 30, I and my father are one. Now, this octut, this concept of, of oneness that he's speaking of. Most likely, he said, God, this oneness, and we can look at it as a plural oneness. Me and God, we're inseparable. Well, you can imagine what that did to the Jews who'd already defended their faith with the Maccabees' son to death and all the different things, not to worship anything else. 
Uh, the Jews picked up stones uh, to stone him. Jesus answered him saying, I have shown you many good works or, or miracles from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for the good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. <laughs> they had remembered not too long ago during Kisla 25, there was a man who was crazy. A lunatic said God manifest, and he came into the temple. And they kicked him out. And here Christ comes, Mashiach, the Jewish Messiah, and says, listen, I'm with you. And here I am. See, it wasn't, it wasn't that he was blaspheming, and it wasn't that he was being rude or anything else like that. He was just revealing to them who they were. And they picked up stones to stone him. And, of course, they go on down there, and he talks about Father and him, and he says that he escapes arrest. Because he just caused a big old scene in the middle of one of, their, one of their festivals. So what does this all mean? You know, Jesus observed, observed Hanukkah. Why? Festival of lights. It's so neat that John wrote about Jesus and we see the account of him being there. Why? Because John uses these metaphors. What does he say? He uses Jesus as the light of the world. You read John 1, and the, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was the light of the world. Now, if you look on a menorah, or Hanukkah is the nine one, the menorah is the seven one. You look on a Hanukkah or a menorah, there's one in the middle that sticks up a little farther than the rest of them. They call the shamash. What does that mean? Servant. You know, it's with that one that's more elevated that they light every other candle for each night. Oh, Jesus came as the servant, the light light every one of us and he lit every one two hundred years before they deconstructed an altar they didn't know what to do with the stones when Messiah come he'll reveal you know it says they put them in a very convenient place right there at the temple mountain if you've ever been there's no loose stones really around in the temple the only loose stones that were there were the ones that had been defiled. I can imagine, although I can't prove it, I can imagine those were the very, the very stones that they were wondering what to do were the ones they were picking up to stone their Messiah. It got me thinking as I was praying yesterday. I said, God, how is it? And I began to think and meditate on the Word of God, but in Jesus talking about the temple. He said, when they, they were trying to marvel at all the stones on the temple, he said, tear this temple down and in three days I'll raise it again. He also wept over Jerusalem and said, not one stone would be left in another, speaking of the temple. And I got to thinking about those different things because in that, Messiah had given them their answer. Any temple that has not been dedicated is torn apart. You know, those defiled stones were with the rest of the temple. Herod's temple had been defiled by wicked priests and all manner of ungodliness. The whole temple was leveled to the ground. The stones that were defiled, Messiah said, they'll just be a part of the rest of the rubble. And I got to thinking, how can we apply that today in our Christian walk? In the season of Hanukkah that we are, the festival of lights, Jesus being the eternal light, the servant's light, that will light every soul that will come to him. I got to looking in my life. Peter talked about, are you not living stones? You know, sometimes, like Pastor Bond was saying, we, we acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, but we get to the place where there's stones in our life, there's things in our life that become defiled, and we don't know what to do with them. <laughs> to the ones who don't know Messiah, they're ready to stone him. They'll take the stones of their life and that's what they did, and that's what Paul was talking about in Romans. They, they knew that God exists, but they willingly suppressed the truth. They would just throw their defilement. But we in this season, just like you have already done, you've already done it today. What did we do? We dedicated our life. Did you know that you Hanukkahed your life to Christ today? You dedicated your life to Christ. How appropriate during this season that we, in our Judeo-Christian faith, 
acknowledge Messiah as king and give him every stone of our life that has been defiled. And he dedicates it and he washes it. There's nothing but the blood of Christ. It covers everything. It cleanses everything. In Sunday circles, what do we do? We make a decision. That's what you did today. You've already done it. God has already made a way. Now, every stone in your life now can be built on Christ. And I would tell you, anything that you try to build outside of that is destined to be leveled. And that's what Jesus was trying to say to them. When you take a temple and you dedicate to something else, whether it's just this, this earthly body to live in, and all you do is you dedicate all your time to it, do you know one day it'll fail? Or whether you try to build your life and your principles, I'm a really good person and I'm going to dedicate my life with this, you don't realize the stones have already been defiled. No matter how good you think you are, how much you think you can clean them up on your own, you can't. It is only by the blood of of Christ Jesus, that they become sanctified, dedicated, same word, Hanukkah. Susan, what is your question for today? Um, how does one get saved? How do you know that you're saved? How do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? I'm going to pray a prayer with you. If you'll sincerely pray this prayer with me, mean it from your heart, you will be saved. And you'll know that if you died, you'd go to heaven. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I realize that I have sinned against you, but I am willing to repent. I choose to repent, to turn away from being a sinner. And right this moment, I open the door of my heart, and I take you, Lord Jesus, into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you. Fill me, Lord Jesus, with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, it's very important that you contact us because we have some information to help you get started in your Christian life. I would like to write a letter to you so that you can know how to win your friends and your family to Christ. And then we'll send you other information to help you get started. So here it is. Remember, realize that you've sinned against God, choose to repent, and receive Jesus into your life. Jesus said, him that cometh to me, or her that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to him, he will not cast you out. You can know him and know that you're saved and know if you died, you'd go to heaven. And then share that with others. It's so important that we be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. So call us or email us. Please let us have contact with you so that we'll be able to help you along the way in your Christian life. Find a good Bible-believing, praising, worshiping church and join that church so you'll have a pastor to help you as you go along in your Christian life. God bless you. I believe that God is going to do great things in your life.